My name is Bob Fox, B-O-B-F-O-X. What did you want? And uh, what you were in the... Oh, I was in the service from 1943 to 1946. And attached to... And I was in the 8th Air Force, the Air Service Command of the 8th Air Force. And so I was stationed in England and in Switzerland. Okay. Now, were you from Washington State originally, or were you from out of... I'm originally from Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. So I, I came to Washington in 1939. Went to work at Boeing 1941, military of 43. Did, um, how come you came all the way across the country? Well, my folks were prone to moving around. We went back and forth across the country two or three times, but uh, primarily I was looking for work. And uh, he finally got a job at Boeing, so that's how we wound up here. So your whole family moved? Yes. So was it, was Boeing Boeing was hiring big time then? Not big time. and He wa he got in in 39 and uh, they were starting more on the big time hiring when I came in in 1941. Mm -hmm. And what did your father do? He was an electrician, the same as I wound up as an aircraft electrician. And what, what was he working on in 39? The, uh, what did they call it, the straddle liner? The one that crashed into the bay here a couple months ago, he was working on those. Was there, uh, B-17s were in production in 39, were they? Uh, I wouldn't think they were in production, but they were working on them. Mm -hmm. And I started on a, an airplane that people just don't know about. I, I started work on a Douglas two-engine bomber. Mm -hmm. Boeing was building the DB-7s for England at the time. So that's what I worked on, then went on to the 17s. So they were under contract? Yeah. yeah. Was that um, was that called a Hudson, was it? or No. Uh, gosh, I don't remember what they called it. I think the HUD, the H I'm not sure what the Hudson was. I remember, the, I know the, the DC-3s, which there's one hanging out here, they called them Dakotas. Mm -hmm. Did the, was it a medium range bomber that you were? Oh, I'm sure it would be, yeah. Uh, I saw some of them in England when I got over there and they had taken the guns out of them, off of them, and they put a huge spotlight in the nose of the airplane and they used them at night to fly around and, and uh, shine onto the German airplane so the ground fire could aim, so they could see them from the ground. Mm. They had a tremendous spotlight. <laughs> it's very interesting how they do something like that. Who would imagine? Yeah, yeah. Seems like a pretty dangerous job. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Now, in um, you were in high school when you first got to Washington State? or I had finished my sophomore year, and things were so tough, and I just quit school at the end of my sophomore year. So I didn't go to school in Seattle. So the Depression was still... Make things pretty hard. Yeah, and thing, things were still pretty tough in the spring of 1940, and, and at that time I joined the Civilian Conservation Corps, which was uh, a deal where I got $8 a month and the family got the 22 <laughs> so we got $30 a month. <laughs> Did uh, you have sisters and brothers? Yes. There was nine of us all together, and uh, let's see, there's, I guess there's seven, no, six of us left. And where were you in the order of? Sisters and brothers. I was second from the oldest. I had an older sister who is now deceased, and so now I'm the oldest. So did you? Um, you had some responsibility of being an older child. That oh yes, I. Uh, when we moved from Pennsylvania to California, we were we were there, and and my dad had come up here, and he was supposed to come back down there and bring us up here, but. Uh, I worked in a fruit dry yard for a couple of months to earn a few dollars, and I brought the family up here with a two-ton truck and trailer by myself. I was 16 years old, mm -hmm. so yeah, I had a lot of responsibility. In Do fact, you, I drove probably most of the way from Pennsylvania to California to begin with. So uh, things were that tough that your father went to where there was work, and it was that things were that tough. Yeah. I keep saying we were real poor, but we didn't know it. 
Did uh, Now, what was the fruit yard you worked in down there? We, at, at the time I was there, they were drying pears. Uh -huh. And uh, I was on the crew that was carrying these trays out and laying them out in the sun so they would dry. It's hard work. Did Very, your, did your uh, sisters and brothers, they also work? No. no, no, they were, they were all too young. I was just 16 at the time. And so when you arrived in Seattle, um, what did you do when you arrived here? Well, the folks bought a house, uh, which uh, we, st well, I shouldn't say we still have it. A uh, nephew has the home now, bought it when my mother died in 83. And it needed a lot of work. And uh, most of it was just work. It didn't require money. Uh, for example, the, the sewer line from the basement was too high, so I dug a trench the whole length of the yard to lower that sewer line so the water would drain out. And, and uh, the house wasn't entirely finished, so I, what lumber we could afford to buy, I nailed in place and, <laughs> and finished the upstairs. So it was a lot of work and very little money required. A good thing, because there wasn't any. <laughs> Did you, um, your brothers and sisters, they attend the school up here? Yes. Uh, but you, but you just helped the family survive. Uh. Right. How did you get your electrical training? Well, I did a lot of electrical work at home and around the house and, and cars. I worked on cars from the time I was a little kid. And, and then, of course, when I got to Boeing, I, I started at the bottom in the electrical shop and worked my way on up to functional test. So I had a, a good electrical, aircraft electrical background when I went into service. So what you had done is the bottom of the barrel and board? Oh, putting numbers on wires and, and uh, making up small junction boxes and putting terminals on wires, and mm. <laughs> as basic as you could get. Did you like that, boy? Oh, I liked it, yeah. But I, I, of course, I enjoyed the functional test part a lot more, and that was kind of exciting. And you saw the systems working, and running the landing gear up and all sorts of things. The um, first bomber you worked on, the Douglas bomber, um, now, the war in Europe was going on at that yes. time. So these, you knew these were going to be Oh, used. yes, we knew they were for England. Mm -hmm. Was it a, did you realize we were going to be involved eventually? I, no, I don't think I did. I don't, didn't really think we were going, I guess I didn't really think too much about it. Uh, did the um, when you're building these bombers, did <coughs> was there a lot of support for what the English were doing in the country? Gosh, you know, I so, I don't remember uh, that there was any great amount of sentiment or activity in that area. Now, uh, you eventually uh, did you move on to B seventeens? Did I what? B seventeens to move on to working on them or? Oh, I was glad to get moved on, yes. I think probably what happened is uh, the electric shop, they were putting more and more women in the electric shop because that was a bench job. And so they were moving the men out. And so they moved me down to the final assembly line, which was a great deal. I'm tickled they did. <laughs> so they were all, they were just had started to integrate women into the workforce. Yes. Mm -hmm. So Boeing must have, did they have a shortage of workers, did they? Or? Oh, I don't think they had a shortage. I think they got people fast enough to keep up with the requirements. I know there was at times that I thought we had too many people in the areas, but uh, ultimately there was work for, ever, um, for everyone. Now, when you moved to this down to the assembly line, what were you doing there? Well, I started in by wiring what they called the, the wing junction box, and that was where the wiring from the fuselage was joined with the wiring in the wing, so I worked on that for a while. And what aircraft was that? B-17. Yeah, so once I left the electric shop, it was all B-17. So what did you think about that when you saw the B-17 down there? What was your first impression of? Oh, I, I suppose I was pretty impressed with the size of it and 
the compli at that time we thought it was pretty complicated systems, but they were no nothing compared to today's stuff. So it was pretty large also. Right? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, the DB was probably half the size of the B-17. Two engine. Were they building, were they building them at a fast pace when you were working there? No. Uh, I don't remember for sure, but I think we only had an order for 20, something like that. And then when that order was over that, then, well then they went into what they called the A-20. And uh, it was, had bigger engines, and there weren't very many of those, not too many. But I, I didn't work on the A-20s. So and then once you started down there, you progressed up in what you did? Yes. Uh, so how long did you work at Boeing before you entered the service? I was two years. And you were on, de were you deferred or were you? Well, they, they ran out of deferments for me, so then uh, the uh, Air Force called me in and, and said, well, you know, if, if you wait till you're drafted, you'll wind up the infantry, but we need electricians and, you know, we're offering you a job, so I said, okay. Mm. So you were trained already in what oh, they yeah. want? Yeah, yeah. So I went in on the 19th of July, and on the 19th of August, I was walking up the gangplank in New York City. <laughs> Pretty fast. Five days later, I was in England. So you had accelerated. They, did, they te did you run you through the regular boot camp? Well, I ran at Cali Field. They had what we call basic training. I was there 10 days, I think it was. And it was, you know, we were one day on the rifle range and we went through the gas chambers and and uh, shots galore got nine shots before I left there in ten days mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I went to Taunton Massachusetts and was there I don't know not very long what was in Massachusetts that was just I suppose you'd call it a staging area we I think we uh, were issued uh, uh, the winter clothes again, where we had had the summer clothes and the, the suntans. We went back to the ODs and got more shots. <laughs> Did the, um, the, now when you boarded the ship, and then five days later you're showing up in England? And where did you land in England? We landed in Scotland. Scotland? Uh, I don't remember for sure the name of the place. It was one of those fjords, as they call them. And, uh, we went from there by train to uh, where I was at Bur Burton. I was at a place called Burtonwood Air Depot, and that was probably I would assume it was the biggest one over there. We we got all of the new new aircraft that came from the U.S. and modified them for the theater, and then we got all the ones that were. Uh, too much work for the operational crews to handle. They came back to us. So what would you have to do to an airplane when it arrived? Well, generally there was uh, wiring had to be done. Uh, for example, the, when they came over, the, uh, there was no way to stop the top turret in case the gunner was killed. There was no way to stop the darn thing. It would keep turning. So we had to put a switch in so the pilot could cut the power to the top turret if the gunner was killed or injured. That was one of the changes. And there was another one where the uh, hydraulic pumps, uh, they could shut them off with the switch. And there was a couple accidents because the pilots forgot to turn the hydraulic system on. So we had to put wiring in so that when the gear was down, the hydraulic system was on you know, automatically. So there was things like that. So these are things that they learned in, uh, after the plane was in operation? Yeah, yeah. So it's things that they didn't anticipate at Boeing. Right. And, and because probably, no one probably considered what would happen if a, a crew member got killed. I suppose they thought if he was injured or killed, he would fall out of the turret. But in, in some cases, they fell on the controls and, and stayed there. So there was no way they could get to him and get him out of there with the turret going around. So were you, was there a lot of Boeing employees that had been sent to the same depot? Uh, 
there was three more besides me that I knew, and I think that's the only ones I knew that were from Boeing. Uh, obviously, there was more, but uh, you know, there was an awful lot of people on the base, and it was quite scattered out, uh, depending on what the uh, trade was. For instance, we had a, a huge engine overhaul place, and so I suppose that anybody that was of course, I don't think Boeing had any engine experts at the time, so there probably wouldn't have been any, because all we did was install them here at Boeing. Did, um, now this was a large base, was it? Was it bigger than most bases over there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I have no idea what the size of it was, but we had a real long runway. In fact, we had, we had cross runways, too, so. But it was in, in uh, northern England, so it was beyond the reach of the German bombers, and it was always what we call socked in. 600 feet was a clear day. The Germans tried to find us. They, they flew over at night and dropped uh, bright flares on parachutes and trying to locate us. But okay. luckily they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Did the, um, now planes, when they got to you, they, they they did a lot of repairs on the airfields themselves that they were based out of, did yes. they? The operational bases did what they could do, say, overnight or that type of thing. But then at a certain point you got the plane. They patched holes, you know, the, the flak made a lot of holes in the fuselage wing and, and they actually used the the uh, bottoms of of uh, food cans and riveted them all over the holes. <laughs> So yeah, they did some, would be totally inaccept, unacceptable today. Mm. Were you surprised when you got there, the planes that you saw come back? Mm. Some of them, some of them were damaged pretty badly, mm. yeah. Did you know that they were using soup cans and? Oh yeah, we took them off and put regular patches on. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, when we found that, we took, we took those kind of patches off. Was there a lot of repairs like that in, in and outside the plane of different, like? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I, I didn't work on the patches, but one of the things that I did a lot of work on was the flak had a habit of going into a wire bundle and it would cut a wire off in the middle of the bundle. And they were really tough to find. So most of the time we didn't waste a lot of time trying to find it. We would just run a new wire in mm. and just run it right on the outside the bundle and tie it in because uh, sometimes it was just almost impossible to find it. So there was these planes were riddled with flak. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Some of the pictures he's got over there, we'll show some. Um, the ones that I have pictures of it were riddled were in Switzerland. Did you ever um, think that uh, you ever see a plane that came in there and you thought, how did it ever get here? Yeah, yeah. In, in Switzerland, we, we uh, got one out to, to get it ready to bring back to England and when we tried to start the engines, the fuel ran out of the wing. And so we checked and there was a huge patch on the underside of the wing and we took the patch off and the spar was gone. Mm -hmm. The main spar had been, and <laughs> they just put a patch over the hole and, and that plane flew a bombing mission with the, the bottom wing spar gone. Mm -hmm. So they were, they were pretty tough airplane. It's pretty impressive, I guess. Oh yeah, yeah. Do you think a, a modern day complicated jet could survive that type of damage? Mm, I don't know. Huh. I don't know. Did you, uh, you'd never been out of the United States before this, had you? No. What did you think about England? Oh, I guess I wasn't too impressed with it, but uh, you know, they were under real tough conditions when I got there in 43. Uh, when they said blackout, they meant blackout. You know, you, you couldn't see a speck of light at, at night in any of the cities. And of course, uh, transportation was pretty bad. Uh, very few cars on the road, uh, lots of bicycles. They had lots of horses uh, drawing these big two-wheel carts. Uh, food was, it was pretty tough to leave the base because there was no place you could get food or very few places, uh, all types of signs were removed. There was no street signs, no road signs anywhere. 
So, uh, and that was all taken so that uh, they thought the Germans were going to invade England, so they didn't want them to know where they were going. Mm -hmm. So it was tough to get around, at least to begin with, but uh, later on it got to the point where uh, we would have enough time to go somewhere, not too far. When I went over, we worked a 12-hour 12 uh, shift seven days a week. And even the Army finally realized that, you know, you don't last forever on that kind of a schedule. So we then went to a 10-hour day six days a week, and that lasted right through till the end of the war. So there was that much work to be that? Oh, yeah. So we had two shifts, always two shifts. Mm -hmm. So but we had two 10-hour two shifts per day, but everybody got a day off. And, of course, everybody's day off was a different day, so there was always a crew there. Did they, um, did you ever get a plane that came in that they said, oh, this one's a write-off? And Not in England, but in, in uh, Switzerland, there were several of them that we, we cut, uh, you know, we didn't cut them up, we took them apart and they hauled them into Germany hmm. on big trailers. Yeah, they were, they were too far gone to fix. The, um, the, the blackout and the conditions in England, it was a, a big difference from what you'd seen in Seattle, I take it. Oh, yeah, yeah. What was, what was the difference in the blackout? Was it not as dark here? Or? No, it wasn't as dark here in, in uh, C-43. You know, we, we had blackout. I know we, I, you're not old enough, I guess, remember. They had blue uh, uh, cellophane that we put over the headlights of our cars. In England, they had a, a hood that went out, and it had a grill in the you know in the louvers in the bottom, so it would shine a little bit down on the road. Uh, but uh, any places like the uh, pubs or any building, they had a a little like a porch built out, and it had blackout curtains that you had to walk through to get in. So there was lights on inside, of course. So you really felt like you were in, in the war all of a sudden. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Were the English uh, um, were they grateful to have you there? Or? Well, I think most of them were. Uh, I'm sure some of them probably resented the the Yanks, as they called us. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the girls all liked. <laughs> Now in the pubs, could you get? Was is you could say it was hard to find food? Was it hard to find a beer if you went off? Oh no, there was lots of pubs. They had their their beer. Yeah, there. They had restaurants, but there was no signs out saying what they were. You could walk right past one and not know what, that it was a restaurant. You know, it, it didn't have the big double doors and everything like we have. It'd be just an ordinary door. Mm -hmm. To go in, so unless you knew it was there, you'd walk right past it. Mm. And the the selection of food was really minimal, very minimal. So they were hurting pretty badly. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, did you stay on base quite a bit, or did because of your schedule, you mostly were just on base? I oh, take yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. And things there, the mess hall was good. And oh yeah. <clears throat> we had a time when when. Uh, we were eating sea rations three meals a day. The, the food just wasn't getting through. The submarines were sinking everything that got out there. And a lot of the food was coming over in the new airplanes. The bomb bays on the bombers were full of, full of food, mostly sea rations. <laughs> huh. but, uh, so it was actually that desperate in England? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I took a furlough on site. I went to a home in Coventry and they were, it was the sister of one of our neighbors in Seattle. And so rather than carry the, what they would give me as the, the uh, military food ration, I took the British food ration and I could hold the whole thing in my hands. That was for a week. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I spent a week with those folks and, and of course they took me on a tour of Coventry to, and it was really bombed. Was it pretty shocking for you to see Coventry? Oh yeah, yeah. Were they the people's attitudes? Was it was it different having suffered from bombings all those years? And well, they suffered, but they they took it in stride. I guess they a lot of them had their bomb shelters in their backyards. They they were 
uh, underground, and uh, I don't know how effective they were, but. Did you ever, did there was there any bomb raid when you were there, or? No. Huh. So the, clo so the, the closest I came to a bomb raid, the uh, Germans sent two buzz bombs aimed at us uh, Christmas Eve in, that would have been 44, I guess. And they, they overshot and went, landed in Manchester, which was 20 miles away from us. And I went there the next day, and, and each one of those leveled the whole block. Hmm. Just a whole block of buildings was a pile of rubble. That's sort of hard to believe something could do that, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, they were, they were. Did you ever on your base, um, these planes coming back, you, having worked in Boeing and being real familiar with them, you, you knew there were 10 people that flew those on missions. When you got one son back from a real bad raid and needed repairs, did you ever, I mean, was there blood in the plane and from, did they just send them to you or? Well, we had one plane that came back and we talked about having to wash the tail gunner out of the tail section with a garden hose, but uh, that was probably the worst one I saw. But uh, no, I didn't see any blood, it, just that one plane that was, I don't know whether they, I suppose maybe they cleaned them up a little bit before they came back, but they weren't clean from the uh, wear and tear. They were terrible, greasy and oily, you know, they, the engines would oil all over them. <laughs> so they were, they were well used. We called them war wearies. Yeah. And uh, some of them as, as war, weir war wearies were probably taken out of service. Uh, did, um, did, when they were flowing in, were they flown in by the crews or how'd you get them? Were they ferried in or? I don't know who brought uh, them in. Probably maybe, they probably only had pilot and co-pilot, probably uh, be all there was. Were you working in hangars or working outside? No, we, well, both, but we had hangars. We had a hangar, uh, which we worked in, uh, of course, at night. We had lights in there, but it was totally blacked out from the outside. So when the plane got there, you we, you worked as hard and long as you could to get that plane back. It was Right. So it was that important to get the planes turned around? and huh. did Now, in Switzerland, was that... Uh, was that planes that, how did they end up in Switzerland? Well, they either were damaged so badly they figured they couldn't get back to England or, or maybe they ran out of fuel or whatever. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of them probably had injured uh, flyers aboard. They probably figured they could save them by landing in Switzerland. I don't remember how, there was 110 of them there, B-24s and, and B-17s. and. Uh, I don't remember how many we flew out, but I know they hauled an awful lot of them out by truck and trailer, hauled them into Germany. So they, this was after? After the war. Oh. And once they brought them into Germany, they just chopped them up in pieces. And he's got some pictures over there of, and, and when I got back to England after, after leaving Switzerland, we, we chopped up, I think there was 130 bombers that we chopped up into pieces and stacked them along the railroad tracks. Hmm. Is that hard to do or? Well, the B-24s were quite easy. We used to wrap a cable around them and put a bulldozer on each end and that cable would just slice them in two like nothing. But the, the B-17s, we had to take them apart. Hmm. We couldn't cut them with a cable. <laughs> so it was that tough of a plane, huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So was that a... Um, so you must have had some sort of pride having been a Boeing employee. The well, it was real advantageous because we had no drawings whatsoever. No wire diagram books, no no drawings. And I knew the wiring in that airplane by heart. And so that was a great advantage for me and, and for the military to have someone that, that had the drawings in his head. Now when you talk about war worries, uh, we worked on a project which the historians say didn't happen. We took 15 war-weary airplanes. They were figured they were too far gone to use them as bombers. And we stripped them of everything that we could take off of them and, and still fly them. And we made flying bombs out of them. 
of Project Aphrodite. You read the book? Yeah. You know I, about we it? actually interviewed one of the pilots. Oh, you did? Mm -hmm. Gosh, that's something I've tried to find out. Now, I, I didn't realize at the time, but we had a, a, another program at the same time called Caster, and that's the ones that we built. And I always thought that the ones that, that was in the, I didn't know about this Aphrodite thing until, gee, maybe a couple of years ago I first, I found out about it. But the one thing, and, and he's got the stuff in my documentation there, that what, uh, in Aphrodite they say all of them missed the target. Uh, the, uh, the one, that, one of the ones that we built, and as far as I know, only one was used. It blew up the Heligoland and subpens. And that's when we started getting food again. And that happened in the spring of 44 that we built those bombers. And in Aphrodite, the, the planes were flown by a mothership up above. And the one that was used in our program was flown by a Mustang fighter pilot. And he followed it right down and flew it right inside the subpens. Mm -hmm. And like I say, the historians say this didn't happen, but he's got an article that I cut out of the Stars and Stripes that says it did. And I knew about it long before it came into the Stars and Stripes because a buddy of mine was at the operational base where it took off. And <clears throat> I built the timing devices for the smoke bombs. They put a smoke bomb under each wing, and at a precise time, these smoke bombs went off. So then the Germans would leave it alone. They figured, well, you know, it's already on fire. And uh, I don't know where they got the alarm clocks, but we, we got regular household alarm clocks, and I bolted micro switches to the back of the clocks, and then bolted the clock to the hood over the instrument panel, and that's what set those mm. bombs off at the precise time. Mm. So I don't know if he can, if he can uh, copy that article there. It's there. I, I have the original article. What did uh, uh what what, it, what was did you do to really prep the planes to be flying bombs? What what did you do inside of them to make the bombs? To make them ready for this. As, as flying bombs. Yeah. We took everything you could possibly take off of them. For example, we took all the mechanism to run the bomb doors. Took that out, and we bolted the doors shut. Uh, we took a lot of wiring, for instance, that. Uh, that was not needed for the operation. The bomb racks were taken out, and the bomb bay was filled with about, I think it's, it says in there, 11 tons of something more powerful than TNT. Uh, gosh, I don't remember what all, oh, of course all the turrets were taken out, and we put covers over the holes. And so were you, uh, the, the, now they weren't loaded with explosives, so they were at an operational base? Right, and? yeah. And did you, you obviously must have sort of wondered what exactly was going on, or did you? Well, it's funny, a, a good friend of mine just died here about a year ago. He and I had been in close contact. We were buddies there, and then we were kept together over the years. He didn't know that we were building fire. He thought we were building cargo airplanes. Hmm. And uh, I was probably one of the few that did know what we were building because I was making these timing devices, and they had to tell me what they were for. Yeah but uh, some of the other things we had to have. So did um, you, uh, were you sworn to secrecy? You no, but they, they just simply, I, they probably put the word out that they were cargo ships, I'm not sure. But I, I'm sure that there were very few people who knew what we were doing. Huh. And that was CAS, Project Caster, was that? Caster was the name of the program. Mm -hmm. And what was the difference between Caster? It was just the way it was flowing? I have no idea why. Like uh, I say, I didn't know there was. I didn't know there was another program, this Aphrodite, until probably about two years ago. I was told about the book. So now, did, did the P fifty one pilot? Did he remotely control it? Yes. We had a couple of electronic geniuses that devised the way for they. They were flown through the Norden bomb site. They were able to to fly the airplane through that bomb site. Oh. Of course, that thing was highly secret, but uh, it was always undercover. <laughs> it was? Oh, yeah, they covered it every time the flight crew got out. They put a cover on the Norden bomb site. I don't know what, it wouldn't have done anything for us to see it, but. <laughs>
Did you know how it worked? No. So I, I knew that the bombardier through the Norden bombsite could fly the airplane. I knew it could fly the airplane. But uh, how they figured out to do it remotely, I have no idea. So even though it was in the electrical system of the plane, it was something you didn't need to know about? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Do they have optical people that worked on Norden bombsites? Or? They had special people that worked on them, yeah, that's all they did. Huh. Yeah, I'm sure they were sworn to secrecy and all that good stuff. Huh. We also worked on another program which the historians say didn't happen and even I called Lockheed Aircraft and they said they'd never heard of such a thing. We put a nose, new nose sections on P-38 fighters and put a bombardier. We made a bombardier section and they put a bomb site in P-38s and they flew the what was known as the Triangle Bombing Missions. They, they flew from England, they bombed Germany, and they landed in Italy. They loaded up again, and they bombed Germany on the way to Russia. Then they loaded up again, and they bombed Germany on the way back to England. Mm. And we called them Droop, I say we called them, and they, they were given the name Droop Snoots. And I think if you read the Aphrodite book, it's mentioned, the Droop Snoots mentioned in there. And uh, there was one droop snoot with each, I don't know what you call it, there was probably 20 or 21 P-38s flew in a squadron or whatever they call it, but they had one one bombardier. Hmm. So he he was the guy that told them where to drop the bombs. So all the other P-38s would drop when the bombardier did? Uh, mm -hmm. Right. Have you ever, do you know if there's a droop snoop left around somewhere? I have never seen one. Uh, I'm pretty sure in Aphrodite book it does say that someone has one. But now these no sections came to us complete. Uh, I didn't actually do any of the mechanical work, but I uh, did some of the wiring. And uh, the uh, mechanics there, and, and there are two of the Boeing guys that I knew, uh, and, and both of them are gone now, so I couldn't get them to verify the story. but. They took the old nose sections off and put the new nose sections on, mm. and they came to us complete. So I would swear that, uh, well, I shouldn't say I swear, but I'm sure that Douglas, or not Douglas, Lockheed built those nose sections. Uh. But uh, the people I talked to said they'd never heard of such a thing. When the, uh, the Germans came up north looking for you and dropping flares, um, what, did, what happened on the ground? Well, we usually got a, a warning, I guess, and sometimes they, uh, I know when the buzz bombs came over, we were told to get in the ditches that they had dug around the places, but uh, when the flares uh, came off, uh, you know, some of the time we were probably in the hangar working. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we never got any uh, alert that I can recall for the when they dropped. They didn't do that very many times. So you can hear the plane coming over. Oh, we again. could hear them. Oh. oh yeah, yeah, we could hear them. Sort of the different. buzz bombs, we could hear them. We heard them go over. They had that, uh, what they call it, a ramjet. They would roar for a minute, and then they'd be quiet, and then they'd roar and be quiet. Very distinctive sound. <laughs> so you knew when you heard that. What oh it was. yeah, yeah, we knew what they were. So, so when you heard that, did they did you sort of send a shiver? Well, we had a. Uh, alert system, so everybody ran out and got in these trenches huh. that we had around the barracks. And huh. Did um, you, they ever bring any captured aircraft to your airfield to be dissected? Or? Not at our place, but when I was in Switzerland, a uh, uh, what do you call him? A deserter from. I guess he was from Russia, if I remember right, but he had a German jet, a two-jet, two two-engine jet airplane that, that he came into Switzerland. Hmm. That's the only only one I ever saw captured, or well, he wasn't captured, he just came in there. Did you, did you get a look at it? Yeah, yeah, we were able to go all through it. It was quite a simple, simple build. It was, well, there was a lot of things about it. it was. Uh, Quite significant. It had two different kinds of wheels on it. You know, their their uh, part situation was so bad that they they had different wheels, and I don't remember what else the differences were. Huh. 
So it was obvious to you that the war was t taking a toll on oh, them? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no question about that. Were they built well? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what it was. I suppose it was one of those Messerschmitts, or I, I didn't okay. ever learn what all those were. But Did uh, uh, probably a ME-262? Could be. Uh, Could be. So was that something that was sort of Buck Rogerish to you? <laughs> well, see, we, we had had no experience with jet airplanes. I was, a, well, I say we had no. They had. They brought a P-80 over to our base. Uh, I don't even remember what period of time it came in, and and they were very very secretive with it. They they actually had a cover around it. When they brought it out to the end of the runway, it was covered. You couldn't even see it. And then they'd crank up the engines, and the way it would go, you know. So uh, a couple of days later, it came spiraling down and dove right into the ground. And that, that was the last we saw of any jet airplanes until that one in Switzerland. So they actually would move the cover as the plane was moving? They would, act, yeah, it would, it would be covered until it was moving. So I, don't the, know, I don't know why it was so secretive, but. <laughs> so you didn't know what a P-80 was then? Well, we, we knew, we knew what it, we knew that there was a thing called a P-80 and we knew that we had that one. But that's about all we knew about it. <laughs> did the uh, did, did, was it sort of odd to see a jet? I mean, was it? Oh yeah, we had no idea an airplane without a propeller. You know, that was something really strange back then. Sort of hard to figure out how it like it, how does it work? <laughs> oh yeah, we didn't didn't know anything about it. Uh, did it crash in the, the P-80? Did it crash by your airfield? Right or? on the field, yeah. Never heard why or what happened, but he came straight down. Huh. Pilot get out? No, God, no. No. No, we were, we were in, standing in the chow line probably within a half mile of where he crashed. And some of the guys actually saw it come down. I didn't, but uh, I heard the guys talking right away. And, by the time I turned around to see what was happening, it was all over. Mm. Just lots of flames, I take it. Huh? Lots of flames? No, I don't huh. think so. Huh. Oh, after it crashed? I don't think so. Huh. I, all I heard was it made an awful big hole. Hmm. Did you have many planes crash in your airfield? No, no. We, I think we were really fortunate for the number of planes that went in and out of there and the low ceiling, the fog all the time. We only had one crash that I that I knew of, and a B-26 came in and landed on the icy runway and couldn't stop, and uh, right at the end of the runway there was a road that was depressed, and when he went through that he left all three gear on the road. But uh, none of the crew were injured, and, and the airplane slid out into the field without a lot of damage. Huh. Of course, it, it wasn't fixed up. That, that was a total. But we had thousands of airplanes, thousands. Before D-Day, we had 5,000 airplanes on the field ready to go. And of course, you probably have read where D-Day was supposed to start on the 5th of June. And so on, I think it was probably the 4th, and we started taking or sending airplanes out. And I don't know how long it took to take them all, but there would be six fighters on the runway at the same time, or three bombers, and the fighters would be staggered, two. And two would be lifting off, two more would be about halfway down, and two more would be starting out, and they just kept on. And that went on for, I don't know, two or three days. And then the bombers, there was three in that same type of a formation. But we had 5,000 airplanes in dispersal areas ready to go for D-Day. So had they just used you as a place to hide aircraft or? Well, we weren't necessarily a place to hide them. Well, I suppose you can say that, but we had serviced them all. Uh -huh. they, they were all, uh, you know, okay for flight, fueled. Uh, so 5,000 airplanes on, one air, on your airfield was not at, abnormal? Well, it normally, yeah, it would, we wouldn't normally have that many airplanes, but uh, it was obviously preparation for D-Day. So were you, you knew, did you know it was the invasion or did you just think something was up? 
we heard, uh, well, we, we kind of figured something was up with, with us keeping that many airplanes on the field, but uh, there was an announcement came on the BBC, I, I don't remember it, but anyway, it was supposed to happen on the 5th, and it was, uh, what would you call it, a preliminary release, or it was released before it was supposed to. But so then we knew when we heard that, we knew it was imminent. But then, of course, it didn't happen until the 6th. So actually, the press sort of tipped their hand then. Mm -hmm. uh, were you surprised? Well, well, I think it was actually set for the 5th, and uh, due to weather conditions, they postponed it. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, the press probably shouldn't have, <laughs> shouldn't have released it. Mm -hmm. But you know, I, I kind of laugh about some of this stuff. We were so secretive on a lot of things, and our mail was, was uh, what do you call it, censored. And uh, the, uh, even if you wrote the word Jeep, it was cut out. It was cut out of your letters. I, I, my mother kept all my letters, and I looked at some of them here recently, and, and they're cut up so bad she couldn't even tell what they were. We couldn't tell where we were. We couldn't tell what we were doing. Uh, if we mentioned the name of a city, it was cut out and so on. But what happened, which makes this all a huge joke, when we landed in Scotland, everything was secret. You know, we got on a train in the middle of the afternoon, we traveled. Somewhere in the middle of the night, we stopped along the tracks. We didn't go into a station. Four o'clock in the morning, we got off the train jumped out in mud and they loaded us into trucks, hauled us into a mess hall and fed us some sea rations. And while we were eating, the cook had a radio on and Lord Ha Ha, you ever hear of Lord Ha Ha? Was on the radio. And he welcomed us to Burtonwood. He told us how many there were. He knew who we were, what group we were. He knew everything about us. And he says, we'll pay you a visit one of these days. Now that's that's how great the secrecy was. Just so people that don't know, who is Lord Haha? -Ha? Lord Haha -Ha was an Englishman that deserted and went to Germany, and he was their mouthpiece, and he was always uh, telling things about the Americans, and and uh, just like the Japanese woman uh, telling that the girlfriends were waiting or they were stepping out on you, and doing all kinds of things, trying to to. Uh, break the morale of the American boys, men. What happened to him? They hung him at the end of the war. They uh, they brought him back to Germany, and or back to England and hanged him. So the Japanese woman fared a lot better though. <laughs> Did um, the English, you talked about their, um, the way they were, so the, the stiff upper lip is, is that, their attitude, where they toughed it out and met the challenge, and well, I suppose you know things in England were really backward alongside of what we were. Uh, we had a guy that came to our barracks uh, later on in the war, and we had gave him our clothes for his wife to wash, and we asked him if he his wife had a washing machine. He said, "Oh no, he'd never let her have one of those things." Refrigeration was unheard of. Uh, you know, you go down to where the meat markets were, all the meat was hanging right out in the open. There was no refrigeration. Hmm. In the homes, I got into a couple homes, they, uh, they did their cooking uh, mostly on a coal fire. Uh, it was a fireplace, but they used coal in them, and it had a kind of an oven on the side. They also had gas, and uh, they had a meter there that they had to keep putting money in. And that's the way they got their gas. They had to mm. put the money in the meter as, as they used it. <coughs> Did you ever meet any English girls go out in the pubs and stuff? Oh yeah, oh yes, I met several. I, in fact, I still communicate with one. My wife and I communicate with her. <laughs> mm. See someone from back then, from the war? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Now why, why is it, why do you write to her? Well, that's a good question. We we write every Christmas, and uh, she was a real nice person, and and uh, I suppose we had similar interests. I was interested in music, and so was she, and I didn't know her very long, but 
Was she a girlfriend or? No, I wouldn't call her a girlfriend. She was in the uh, military, what was it, the, uh, I forget what, it was the Navy, the Women's Navy. So she was in that. Yeah, I met her at a dance at the Red Cross Club, and so we, we met two or three times after that. And She took me on the tour of the waterfront of uh, Liverpool. They had a uh, elevated railway that went along the waterfront, and so she took me on that. So still a memorable time. Oh yeah, yeah. The other thing that I guess why I kept writing to her, I I was real acquainted with a guy in Switzerland, and. Uh, of course, he couldn't speak English and I couldn't speak German, but she was fluent in German. So I would write a letter to him and she would translate it into German and send it on to him. And so we were communicating back and forth that way. Did you know what she was doing in the war effort? No. Hmm. I have no idea. But she spoke German at that time? Oh, yeah, yeah. Huh. She, she was, a, I know her civilian job was a school teacher. But she never talked about what her duty was. <coughs> no, mm. no. Mm. She knew what I was doing, though. <laughs> never asked her this day if she was translating documents, or? I don't recall ever talking to her yeah. about her what, what she was doing. Mm. Mm. A lot of those uh, women, they had the, the Army and the Navy and the Air Force. I don't remember what they call them. But they were drivers. They drove cars for the military. and. I'm sure they did a lot of paperwork. When you were at your time in Boeing, you must have seen the emergence of Rose at Riverdale and more and more women coming on to oh, that. Oh yeah, oh yeah. There was, you know, they. When I first went into the final assembly, there were very, very few women. But by the time I left, there was probably fifty percent. Yeah, there was a great deal of women in there. So they, they slowly moved into what people perceived as man jobs. Mm -hmm. Electricians? No. We didn't have any women on the functional test. Uh, no, I don't think we had any in the electrical uh, on the final assembly, but back further in the wing line and the body line, uh, they probably had women doing wiring there. In fact, I know they did. We, we have a group now we call ourselves Over the Hill. Uh, these are guys that I worked with over the years. There's one couple I worked with both of them in 1942. Okay. And we're still getting together and having potlucks once a month. <laughs> Is the, um, was there acceptance of women or was it a novelty? Oh, I'm sure there was an acceptance. It might have been novelty to begin with, but uh, I'm sure there was acceptance. And when you returned from the war, did you go back to Boeing? Or? Yes. I went back on the B-29. Of course, the, B the 17 had stopped production. I don't know when they stopped it, but uh, I went to work on B-29s. Did, um, were the women still there? Oh, yeah. So once they, the war ended, they didn't displace the women? Well, I think uh, probably what happened, most of them, like myself, got laid off. You know, I, don't, I only worked probably two or three months when I got back, and they cut back so far, they, they laid us all off. So then I was off for about five months, mm -hmm. and uh, I went back in, <laughs> in a trade that was entirely not mine. I went in as a jig builder, working with steel. And, uh, Luckily, they had the thing called the X card system then, so I put in an X card right away from my former job and luckily got it back. Hmm. So all of a sudden, there was no need for bombers anymore. That's right. Uh, well, and we went from the uh, B-29, they went to the B-50, which was a uh, B-29 with bigger engines and quite a few changes, of course. Huh. But they never went into production, I don't think. Hmm. Let me interrupt you just for a minute here. And 
skin. No, you, you have some questions? Are you done? I'm seeing if you have some. Yeah. Okay. So a, lot, a lot of times... The, Is the this off now? No, no, oh. we're still recording. Oh. <laughs> we're close to changing taste. Ken likes, uh, you know, the, the person sitting back there always thinks of questions as they're going through your material. Oh, he's, he's going to question. I was looking through your, uh, your uh, pictures over there and your information and... <clears throat> Couple of questions. Uh, did you take the photos yourself, or did you gather those from other people? No, I think I took most of them. They weren't really legal, but I did it. I, I had a folding camera that I carried in my pocket, and I could flip it out and take pictures. Uh. <laughs> Again, it was it was ridiculous. The Germans had pictures of everything we owned, and so why was it so? You know, what was all the fuss about us not taking pictures? Right. Where did you get the camera? Did I bought it in England. I don't remember what I paid for it. And probably not a lot. But it was fairly small, and it was one of those folding kind. You know, it had a bellows, uh -huh. so it was real convenient. What was it life like in the Quonset hut that you first arrived in? Cold. <laughs> The first one I was in, they, they were still building the base and it didn't have the end walls in, so it was just the, the curved part. And, and the landscaping hadn't been done right and the water ran right through the place. We had to tie our shoes to the bed and anything you didn't want to get wet, you laid it on top of your bed. But they were always cold. We had a stove that was about this big around and about that high that was in the middle of the barracks. Mm -hmm. And you could sit there and blow your breath right across the thing you know, when it was red hot. But other than that, you know, it was after they got the end walls in and uh, it was fairly comfortable. We, we had no, no lockers. You kept everything in your duffel bag, which stood on the floor. And uh, we had the bunk. We, we had mattresses, which they called biscuits. They were three, three pieces. If you got three that had the same filling and were the same thicknesses, you were really lucky. You know, one would have sand, and one would have sawdust, and one would, you got no. And when you laid on it, they would separate, so you always had that gap under you. So I bought newspapers in town, and ultimately we got boxes came in, so we got cardboard. So we put paper underneath the biscuits on the springs to keep the air from coming up in that gap. Oh. Of course, we only had two blankets, so we wound up usually putting your overcoat and whatever else you could on top of their blankets to keep yourself warm. Mm -hmm. And you didn't have pillows? No. I used my, one of my jackets for a pillow. <laughs> um, now what did you do for entertainment? Did you hang out in the Quonset hut a lot doing stuff like that? Or? Well, I suppose I spent a lot of time writing letters, but uh, other than that, you know, we, we didn't really have a lot of time off. You, we, we worked a 10-hour shift. We had, I don't remember, I don't know, I suppose we got up a couple hours before the shift, and the time you came back from shift and had your dinner, and uh, it was time to go to bed again. So, yeah, there, there wasn't a lot of free time. Uh, you mentioned... Uh, something about your laundry in your writing there? Well, to begin with, we had what they call lend-lease laundry. We, we sent our clothes into the, the British, and it took six weeks. Now, we had two pair of coveralls, so when you sent, you know, you, you wore each coverall six weeks, and after you worked on war-weary airplanes that were grease and oil all over for six weeks, your cover, coveralls would stand up by themselves. And uh, let's see, we had, I think we had five sets of underwear. And sometimes we tried to wash our own stuff, but you could wash, but there was no way to dry. You know, we weren't allowed to hang anything outside, mm -hmm. and we weren't allowed to hang at the barracks. So where else would you help, you know? Uh, sometimes we took stuff uh, over to the hangar, and we'd hang stuff on the wall in the hang inside the hangar, let things dry. but. It was a problem. You just wore your clothes. For six weeks. Six weeks. 
Um, the other thing, the British Laundry, they, they must have used steel rollers for, for their ringers. Anything with buttons came back, came back without buttons. <laughs> so I, I cut aluminum buttons, you know, real, real small pieces of aluminum, and I hit them with a ball-peen hammer to dish them a little bit, drilled a couple of holes, and I sewed. So I had aluminum buttons on all my clothes. <laughs> Um, you had a hangar major that became flak happy. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> he he flew as he uh, went mentally off in flying. You know, it, it just got to him. He he was, how would you describe it? Mentally, he couldn't handle it anymore. So mm -hmm. they okay. they grounded him and put him in, in in the hangar. Did I say he was a major? Yeah. He was a lieutenant when he came to us, mm -hmm. and then he went on up. Heck of a nice guy, but. In fact, his name is on one of those uh, things you copy there. The, uh, uh, that was the word for anybody that... Uh, that uh, from being in battle, they got... Yeah. There was a lot of... Tra trauma from it, and so they kind of went... Okay. There, there was a lot of guys that wound up as what we call flak happy. And not necessarily all pilots, either. They, these were, uh, I would suggest... Was, I suppose some of them were infantrymen and whatever, but they came back. We had the hospitals and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a picture there, um, and it says that it's the remains of a B-24 that you were supposed to fly in. What was the story behind that? Well, you've probably heard the stories of the volunteers taken. This buddy of mine, which I mentioned earlier, that died about a year ago, we were loading this B-24 to go to Switzerland, and we com complained to the captain that we thought that we were putting too much stuff in that airplane. We thought it was loaded too heavy. And, and he says, well, two guys have to ride that airplane, and you're it. So we complained. We, we were very, very concerned about it. And uh, that night, two guys volunteered to go in our place. And they volunteered because they knew the crew chief on that airplane. And I watched that airplane crash from the air. I was in another B-24, and I watched it crash. And I don't know if it was due to being too heavy or not, but ironically, the only two survivors were the two guys that volunteered. Oh, wow. So, it, But if I had been on the airplane, I wouldn't have made it, because these were two cocky devils that, that didn't believe in seat belts and this sort of thing. And my buddy and I would have been seat belted, and, and we would have been killed. Oh, wow. So I wound up as the pallbearer for the four who died. A place called Munzingen. Did I write that in there? I don't, I don't okay. know. Okay. Munzingen is the uh, American cemetery in Switzerland. Hmm. Did you have many experiences like that with. Did, losing, what? did you have many experiences like that, losing friends or people no. from around there? No. Yeah. I wasn't uh, on an operational base, so I didn't know. The only other experience I had, and it wasn't, I wasn't there, but one of my neighbors was killed on his first mission. He was a yeah. tail gunner, and, and uh, I had found out where he was over there, and I was going to write to him and find out, you know, so we could probably meet over there, and I never got that far. He was killed on his first mission. It says you took a test flight in one of the airplanes in one of the photos. Well, did you yeah. do that often? Did you? personally test flight? O only, in Switzer only in Switzerland I went on some test flights. Okay. And that was the airplanes we put back together and, and oh, did flew them to see if they were safe to go back to England. Um, what I did on those flights is I paralleled the generators. There was a, a way you had to adjust the generators. You had to sit down in be between the pilot and co-pilot and and you could see the instruments between the pilot's legs, so you could set the generators. Hmm. Did you have an emotional attachment to the airplanes you worked on, being that you worked on them and building them in Seattle, and then you were fixing them in war? Did you have a certain feeling towards airplanes? <laughs> oh, I, I, I don't know. I guess we, we were favorable to the, Bo the airplanes built at Boeing because they were better. Mm -hmm. they, they were uh, the... Uh, What's the right word? The quality.